Hi everyone, welcome to Potluck Food Talks. And this is Basque Country Part 2 with Phil Walter. So what did we talk about last time? We talked about pinchos, we talked about grilling. What else What else do you think is important to mention? You mentioned Persebes last episode, but I don't think we elaborated on what Persebes actually are. Sure, go ahead. Well, um, Persebes are, I mean, for me anyway, they were a very unique product to like that, that region, you know, that I've never seen before. And they're a delicacy, they're goose barnacles. They're like, well, you can't really call them shellfish, can you? They're, they're, but they're seafood that grow as barnacles on rocks out in the ocean that then get boiled and then you you basically peel them and, and suck the meat out of them sort of similar to a clam kind of like a razor clam actually if you think about it the flavor and texture wise yeah i agree like, but, but they look completely different they look completely different they look really freaky if you've never seen a goose barnacle they look kind of like an alien i i was going to say an alien that's <laughs> why <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. but they're really, really tasty. Um, and they are a delicacy. I mean, they are very notoriously difficult to harvest. And goose barnacles are a big business in the best country because, um, you know, people go out and gather them, but it's very, very dangerous. So not everybody does it, but you can sell them for a lot of money. You know, a fair amount of people die each year trying to get them. You also have this whole culture around mushrooms when they're in season. Yes. And my favorite mushroom dish is the one you get at Gambara. Mm. Yeah. Which is just grilled boletus. Boletus is the same as porcini. Sliced, grilled uh, with an egg yolk and that's it. And it's amazing. It's so good. It's just so extremely simple, you know. And then you get the raw egg yolk in the center that you kind of break and dip the mushrooms into. And it's, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, it's crazy. If you're in the Basque country, especially around that season, you know, you have to go eat the gambada mushrooms at least once. Like, it's it's a little bit shocking because a plate of mushrooms costs you like 20 quid, I think. Yeah, around well, that. Yeah. yeah. But it's, you know, the mushrooms are amazing. Like, it's a prime ingredient, you know, like boletus is not cheap. Another of my favorite places is uh, Chepecha. This is a, a place that specializes only on preserved anchovies. And you get like a slice of, of toasted bread with an, an anchovy on top. No, it's not even toasted, the bread. And and a, a topping on top of the anchovy. So it could be like a vegetable vinaigrette uh, with, with a vegetable bournoise. Or my favorite is with preserved sea urchin, which is amazing. I've never tasted anything that tastes so much like sea. And the other one would be like with a mixture of mayonnaise and king crab, which is also pretty good. That's, that's amazing. Well, of course, we also have to talk about uh, all the Michelin starred chefs that are in the region, like San Sebastian for a long time was uh, the number one place with, with the largest concentration of Michelin stars per capita. Now it's Kyoto and San Sebastian is second. But uh, I mean, it's like uh, 180,000 inhabitants city and there are how many three michelin star restaurants mugaritz has two there are also a bunch with one uh, it's crazy i mean and they're just meters away one from each other it's crazy yeah especially because you know san sebastian isn't like a huge city it's a it's a town you know and again it's just like this, this food centric culture in the basque country this like obsessiveness with cooking and with, you know, high quality food and high quality ingredients and this like technique forward drive is really unique, you know, around the world. It also has been very influential. Like in the 60s, a culinary movement was developed in France called the Nouvelle Cuisine, where many things changed there. Tasting menus were introduced, ordering wine by the glass, having dishes designed with a, a specific portion, a, a specific amount of sauce so that it could fix in a in a longer menu, the way of plating, of presenting dishes, like many, many things changed. And there were two of the most influential Basque chefs that went to France to get impregnated of, of all this set of knowledge. These were Subihana and Arasak. And they came back and about 10 years later, in the 70s, 80s, they replicated this movement and adapted it into the Basque reality. 
and that's what kind of what, where it started that all these restaurants started getting Michelin stars chefs would train with these chefs and create their their own restaurants with their own Michelin stars and and it has been like a legacy among Basque chefs that still continues today and and you just you still see the influence of this in pinchos bars and, and in other culinary movements such as the, the Spanish avant-garde and the new Nordic cuisine movement were also influenced by, by the new Basque cuisine. Yeah, the, the amount of influence is crazy. Like if you look at Azak, you know, it's like a family restaurant in San Sebastian and like he goes to France, you know, gets his inspiration, comes back and the worldwide influence that he's had is crazy, you know. In so many ways, you know, like now it's sort of speaking about new Nordic cuisine, you know, and like all the influence that that had together with Ferran Adria and the Catalan sort of like movement, it changed the culinary world worldwide, literally. Did you know that the Ferran was cooking like classic until the mid 90s? And he was inspired by Arzac to start doing crazy creative dishes as the ones he does today. I always remember that video of uh, Ferran and Arzac um, in a in a bar together talking about gambas. Have you seen that one? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think Arzac is saying that squid is a blue fish and Ferran says, you're, you're crazy. What does that even mean? <laughs> what does that even mean? Like a blue fish. <laughs> and yeah, they're talking about like that uh, Ferran is saying sort of like, oh, when you get the shrimp in, you have to let them rest for one or two days. Then they're only really good. And I was like saying, no, you have to cook them as fresh as possible. And they get really angry about it. And he's like, no, 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 you have to. Well, Ferran is kind of staying calm. He's like, no, you have to just put them in the fridge for two, three days. And Arzak's getting really angry. And he's like, what are you saying? Man? You're crazy. He's so cool, man. And, and everybody loves I was in a in a conference in Germany where uh, his daughter Elena was giving a, a presentation, and when they showed a picture of Arzak, there was like a, a minute standing ovation from everybody. It was crazy. He's such a funny guy, man. He's just a lovable guy. Another relevant topic is dining societies. Yeah, that's something crazy about the Basque. Absolutely, there are some. Crazy customs that you won't see anywhere else. One of them is dining societies. I will get to that in a minute. But another one is what they call cuadrillas. Cuadrillas is like your group of friends since your childhood. I mean, everybody has like a group of friends that you went to school together and perhaps you grow up and you still have that group of friends. But here it's like an institution. It's like an actual group with members and people gets into it like, like oh, we have a new member of our quadrilla. And then the, they also have this dining societies, which are like clubs, let's say like, like a, a sport club where you have like a tennis court or in a swimming pool and so on. But this is like, like a culinary club with a well-equipped kitchen up to a restaurant level equipment and then dining spaces and families will go there and cook and every family cooks something different and and they, they will cook something really special, not just whatever, like, like something fancy, like a rice with, with lobster or, or, or perhaps a traditional dish or these kind of things. And then, of course, uh, families will, will exchange one with each other and ma make each other taste. And if you're exposed to something like that since you're little, that, that that's like the equivalent to a bar. So everybody has been into a bar or a restaurant and here you also have dining societies. Uh, and I think that's also pretty interesting and probably also one of the reasons why, why people are so knowledgeable about food around here. Yeah, absolutely. And it comes to show you how strong the cultural identity is for cooking, you know. And yeah, these like secret gentlemen's clubs only because it was like for like a long time until very recently, it was just the men that were allowed to cook, right? Yeah. yeah. Or like, or like it was just men that went, I think also. Yeah. And I think that, that there are still some like that today. I'm not sure. That's probably not legal anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I, I mean, every time I've been to a, a dining society, there were women both cooking and eating. So that's not a standard anymore. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's, it's cooking, enjoying yourself, drinking and often singing songs. You know, it's just a nice way of spending an evening, you know, meet up with your friends, cook delicious food. There's like a friendly competition going on who cooks the tastiest stuff, you know, who fucks up the peel peel. <laughs> it, it's good fun. 
Yeah, because Bill, Bill is not a, an easy sauce to cook if you don't know how to do it. It really isn't. I don't think I've ever cooked the tradition of peel peel, to be honest with you. I mean, if you know the technique and how to move the pot and everything, sometimes you, you use like, like a, a strain to whisk the sauce. That's that's one of the tricks. Yeah. You never want to use like a, a tour mix. Otherwise, you will get like a foamy white mayonnaise that has nothing to do with, with this kind of like liquid thick sauce that is usually what you want. Uh. Everything has a, a a way of doing things. And if you don't do it the proper way, you will get a different effect and you will offend people. Like, no, that's not how you cook a chuleta. Like overcooking a chuleta, it's like a crime around here. Like a medium rare steak? But yeah. It has to be raw. People get angry about that. They, they don't even ask you how you would like your chuleta here. If you want it rare or meat, no, you will get it as it is. And you should eat it as it is. It is also a crime to ask to send a chuleta bag to get it a little bit more cooked. <laughs> Honestly, I've never seen that. I've never seen anybody do that. I saw that once, man. And the, the waiter was like, are you sure? And the guy like, yes. And he looked him with a face of, oh, man, you have no fucking idea. This Disgusting, yeah. <laughs> it was a French guy. There was really hate in the waiter's eyes. Understandable. So, and the other nice things is the way they cook grilled fish here, because it's quite common that they will grill the fish until it's very raw in the middle. And then they would take the center spine out and put like a, a mixture of super hot oil, garlic, just a slice of, of dried chili and a little bit of, of apple vinegar. And they would throw this on top of the fish just to, to cook that last punch and, and so that it comes really hot to the table. And that's how 99% of the fishes are cooked around here. And it's always perfect. And it's always delicious. It's super delicious, yeah. It's super, super delicious. I love this this like mix of oil and vinegar with like garlic is super delicious. And it's like one of the things that I took away from cooking in the Basque country for like using for fish, especially like seafood is so nice. I mean, that's what I do at El Cano. They have like a glass bottle, like a pouring bottle with, I, th I think that's it, sir. I think it's like garlic that's like lightly fried in oil then it's cut with vinegar i heard that the the ahomihi the, the this uh, mojo this sauce that they have at, uh, at el cano and I, actually i haven't heard of other places that still have this kind of things it's like a super secret recipe that the owner would go like to the to, <laughs> to like a different room every time he is going to make it and then come back with with the sauce already made <laughs> It was like that at, at Shibari when I went to eat there. I mean, this is a long time ago. Like, uh, it was, what, 2013. Now it's different. Now he's got chefs and stuff. But back then, it was still, like, only him, you know, cooking. Yeah, it was him, another chef who was doing pastry, and then, like, three Asian guys who were just, like, cleaning salads and stuff, who were interning. Now he's got, like, actual chefs and people are plating and stuff. But, like, when I was there, that's where we got, like, a kitchen tour and stuff. And they were saying, like, when Vitor is cooking and, like, making the charcoal and stuff, um, nobody's in the room. Like, it's just him. That's crazy. Hello there. I just finished editing this episode. And since this is part two of Basque Cuisine and Gastronomy, I think it's worth mentioning that Eric is currently offering some really cool food tours in San Sebastian. Go to Eric's website gastrojams.com and book your private food tour. The link is in the episode description. You can expect a complete hassle-free eating frenzy. Eric will take you to the best bars in town and fill you up with each place's specialty. You just have to follow along and eat. Oh, and drink amazing Basque cider. Check out the different tour packages on his website and you will see it's super affordable. Also, if you're enjoying the show, make sure to follow and subscribe. We're trying to make more and better episodes, and we can only do it with your support. If you have any questions that you want us to answer on the show, you can contact over Instagram or email. The info is in the description. Potluck Food Talks airs every Monday 